Nothing would be better than the Temptations Ball of Confusion. Leading in to John McMullen or 97.3 ESPN.com, Eagles and NFL Insider. John, you've seen a lot of things around the NFL. But when I first saw this story come out from the Philly Voice that basically is painting Carson Wentz the way it is, the first thing I thought of was you because there's many times that you have said in covering the NFL that people have different perspectives on the same thing. It's almost like the, the blind people describing the elephant story. You know, one guy has his hand on the tail, one guy has his hand on the leg, and they describe the elephant in different ways. And I almost feel like that is similar to this Carson Wentz story. Wow. It, it, that's tremendous, Josh, because I think you're looking over my shoulder about what I'm writing right now. Because that's what this is. It's about perception. And, and people can see the same thing and look at it differently because of their particular personality. And I, I don't think any of this should be a surprise. I mean, those who kind of paint, paint Carson Wentz as a perfect person or uh, things of that nature, and, and there's going to be certain people that look at that and, and rebel from it and go in a different direction, and I think that's what you have here. I said the one adjective in Joe's report, and, and Joe's a very good reporter, uh, so don't think he's – making this up or throwing it against the wall. Uh, these are people in that locker room who are, who are saying this. But while I say that, it, it's, again, you're looking at something. You're looking at a player who's very competitive. He's uncompromising. I think that was the one adjective we can all agree on. And, and people behind the scenes have said that. Look, the guy is headstrong. He believes in himself. And he believes in a certain way to do things, and that rubs some people the wrong way. And then you kind of go off down different roads. For instance, the, the mentality that he plays favorites, and this is a Zach Ertz-centric offense. Well, if you look, look at the statistics, it's not true. He targeted Zach Ertz, I think it was 9.6 times a game. Nick Foles was at 9.2 was almost the exact same. So then you have it playing into these narratives that are not completely true. And what this is, and if Ryan Rothstein was there, he would appreciate this. When, when you have 70 people in a locker room, and that's what you have, 53 on the active roster, 10 on the practice squad, injured guys, if you think 70 people are going to like everybody and going to be on the same page, I'll show you a unicorn. It doesn't exist. And what Doug Peterson's strength as a coach has been to this point is sort of managing situations like this. And I think he'll manage this one. The fact that certain people don't like Carson Wentz should not be a surprise to anyone. Isn't the also, John, likability subjective? You know, like, for example, you know, you may – be okay working with somebody, but it's not that same person who go out and have a beer with them, right? You know, like, you know, every guy can get along in a locker room, but it doesn't mean they're all going to hang out outside of the locker room. Yeah, I mean, you'll be shocked, but there's certain people that don't like me, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, it really is. I mean, everybody should just think about your own personal circle. And there's people that like you, and there's people that don't like you, and sometimes it's not fair. Sports is no different. John, you know, when someone comes out with a story like this, and, you know, we, we've seen the responses from Lane Johnson, from Fletcher Cox, from Zach Ertz, just vehemently de you know, denouncing it, and some of the other Eagle players that have come out you know, on Twitter very, you know, very forcefully. You know, it really feels like that this story that was written – is is it fair for me to say that maybe some of it was misinterpreted by the person writing it? No, I, I don't think it was misinterpreted. I, I just think people tend to focus on the negative. Okay. And selfishness, egoism, uncompromising. If you also read the article, it, it talks about how intelligent he is, how hardworking he is. 
Uh, so there are parts where everybody agrees on. And, and I think, you know, you see it in movies. You got that one hardworking kid who, who rubs everybody the wrong way. The really intelligent kid who rubs people the wrong way. And even religious. Religion, I, I, obviously Carson wears his faith on his sleeve. There are certain people who are not religious that don't like that. And it, it, it's just the fact that this is surprising to people, I guess, is the most surprising part to me. You know, John, when I was reading some of those descriptors of Wentz that you just mentioned, and I'm, and I'm not saying that Wentz is this guy, but I'm purposely bringing up these two players because I've heard the term selfish. I've heard the term uncompromising. I've heard the term egotistical. I've heard the term, the, the same things that they're describing Wentz about, about two other quarterbacks, Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers. Well, I, the, the piece I'm, I'm writing right now on this that's going to be uh, on 973ESPN.com this afternoon, I mentioned Tom Brady. You're, you're exactly right. Now, when you have five Super Bowls on the resume and he's going to another, right? you can get away with a lot more stuff. But the vast majority look at the competitiveness of Tom Brady, uh, the fact that he wants to handle things, that he wants the, uh, autonomy at the line of scrimmage as all positive. You can you forget about the two names you just mentioned, Josh. You could say this about every great quarterback that ever lived practically. Uh, and behind the scenes, uh, it's got some pretty uh, important uh, sources in that building who said the main difference between Carson Wentz and, and Nick Foles is the fact that Carson craves autonomy and Nick doesn't. And Nick is, is completely happy uh, to do what he's told and uh, what he's directed to do, whereas Carson asks questions. Long term, if you want to be really, really consistently and successful in this league, you should crave the former. You should crave the Carson Wentz type because ultimately that's what you should want. But it, it, it doesn't come without hiccups. And, and I think that's part of the growing pains you're sort of seeing here. John McMullen joined us at Boardwalk on the Hotline on 97.3 ESPN. Follow him on Twitter for all your Eagles and NFL news at JF McMullen on Twitter. Soon he'll have the Carson Wentz article up at 97.3 ESPN.com and also available on the 97.3 ESPN mobile app. John, you mentioned Carson's faith and the fact that he wears it on his sleeve. You know, football has always been portrayed as one of the sports where – People are a little bit more, shall I call it, tolerant when it comes to when it comes to religion. Is is it just the way Wentz carries himself with his religion? We know that Nick Foles is very religious. He's even talked about possibly when he retires becoming a pastor, for goodness sake. So, you know, is it is it just how Wentz you know carries his faith, or is it something else about him as well? No, I, I don't think he's obtrusive about it. I, I just think it's natural that people who who don't have a tremendous faith, and by the way, I, I put myself in this category, you don't necessarily understand the other side. Uh, and I think there's there's just automatic questions you tend to ask. And there are people in that locker room uh, who don't have similar faith. It's not about... Uh, being over the top it's not a being uh, about being obtrusive with it it's just the natural inclination to say i don't necessarily understand that because i don't believe in the same things it, it, it's like anything else it's it's different personalities it's what we discussed at the beginning uh everyone's different and they they look at things differently they believe in different things uh, and if they come across somebody with different beliefs and different ways about going about things, sometimes there's a clash, whether it's uh, overt, an overt one or it's under the radar. Uh, they're just not on the same page because they don't have a lot in common. I don't think it's anything more than that. John, you mentioned Doug Peterson. Now he's managing this. Let's look at Doug for a minute. 
Yeah, this is guy in Doug. You know, he was Brett Favre's backup for all those years. We know Doug has kind of tried to portray himself as a player's coach, but a guy who's very good at you know managing the players and the situations that are going on. How do you think Doug is going to handle all of this? Well, it's a good time of year because he doesn't have to talk about it. He doesn't have to deal uh, about it really until the spring. Uh, uh, and from Philadelphia's standpoint, when they get together uh, for off-season work, uh, it'll certainly come up at the league meetings and, and, and things of that nature. But there'll be some time in between. So uh, I think it will um not be as 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 big a deal at that point. So part of it is just the timing is helpful. Uh, although this is turning into such a thing, I wouldn't be surprised if the Eagles addressed it with some kind of uh, boilerplate statement. Uh, I, I don't think there's uh, a, a necessary path they have to take simply because really I, I, I do believe this is sort of a common sense thing in the fact that Anybody who saw it, uh, all 70, 75 players and, and, and then you add the coaches on top of it, uh, all thought the same, all were some monolith and didn't have different personalities and, and didn't, didn't think things differently. And even some people, I, I, hey, some people in that locker room think the Eagles are better with Nick Foles than Carson Wentz. But I, I think the positive part is, you mentioned some of the leaders and Fletcher Cox and Brandon Brooks and Lane Johnson, um, even guys like Nate Sudfeld, Torrey Smith, who's not even here anymore, immediately come uh, to Carson's defense. That shows you he's still pretty well-liked in that building, pretty well-liked in that organization. I think that's the more important part. And the other part is you're never going to, never, ever, ever, are you going to have all 75 of those people on the same page? It's just never going to happen. John, you know, one of the things that was mentioned yesterday on, on the ESPN's NFL countdown was pointed out by Chris Mortensen and Adam Schefter, something that Doug Peterson mentioned last week, something that's also mentioned in this Philly Voice article. Obviously, it's near the end, and most people don't get to the end of the article, but it's mentioned about the fact that I, I've heard now the same thing from multiple places, and even you've said it on this radio station. Carson Wentz now is going to have a offseason where he's not recovering from a knee injury. He's going to have more reps. He's going to have more practice. And there's the potential for him to come back ready to go better next year. So if Carson Wentz comes back better next year, as everyone suggests he's going to, I'm assuming that means there's going to be wins. And if the team is winning, that seems to cover a lot of problems. Yeah, exactly. You know, you look at Tom Brady. I mean, there's a lot of people. We brought him up. There's a lot of people that don't like Tom Brady. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't like his personality. There's a lot of people who don't like his mannerisms on the sidelines when things are going poorly. Uh, when you win, none of that matters. Uh, and Carson's not like that at all as far as uh, some of the things Tom does. So it, it, you know, winning does cure all in any league, any sport, any time. And if he plays at an MVP level again, uh, this will go away uh, very quickly. Uh, it has more to do with the fact that this team was successful with Nick Foles late in the season. And, and there are probably some people who, who recognize that and said, you know, what's going on? Why is he so combative with the coaching staff? You know, you go back to Frank Reich. I mean, people mentioned Mike Rowe and he bullied Mike Rowe. Frank Reich would show frustration about Carson Wentz. It's nothing new. Uh, this guy believes in his abilities and he, and he, and he speaks up and, it, and that is more difficult to handle than the quarterback that is going to just take the marching orders and do what you tell him to do. Uh, but the good coaches in this league, and I think Doug is in that group, understand ultimately you want a collaborative offense and you want the quarterback to be involved, especially if he's as talented as Carson. 
And and I, I think he realizes that. John, you mentioned Brady. Of course, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the two games from yesterday. And I know what everybody's focusing on. Everyone's got their little thing, whether it's the, the no call, whether it's uh, the fact that Mahomes didn't get his chance in overtime. But, John, the one thing that stands out to me that I don't hear enough people talking about, which is at the end of the day, the Rams had more total yards and more passing yards and more rushing yards than the Saints. And the Patriots had more total yards, more passing yards, and more rushing yards than the Chiefs. At the end of the day, the right team won in both games. Well, I, you know, I don't know, right? I, I certainly think the Patriots played better than the Chiefs. Uh, I think it was much closer. Uh, but I, I think the Saints didn't take advantage of early opportunities. And ultimately, uh, that was their downfall. Uh, the fact that they weren't able to punch the football into the end zone early, settling for field goals. And everybody, you're right, is talking about uh, the missed call, and it was egregious. Uh, but it's not the first. I mean, I, I well, John. Also, there were there Twitter. were there were two missed face mask calls. Well, sure. I, I mean, it happens every week in this league. Uh, the fact that it happened in such a big spot in a big game, people overblow it. Uh, human error has been a part of this game forever. And, and then, as far as the overtime, I really don't get that. I mean, everybody knows the rules going in. Yeah, they won the coin toss, but there's no rule that says Kansas City can't stop them from scoring a touchdown. Then Patrick Mahomes would have got the football. Uh, I, I tend to uh, look at the positives as far as Bill Belichick and, and his brilliance and, and, and Tom Brady and what they've been able to do, which is astonishing, especially going through the Eagles and seeing what those extended seasons – uh, put that grind it puts on the team, the fact that the Patriots have been able to do it for 20 years. And then from the Rams' perspective, you got to give Jared Goff a lot of credit. He looked really bad early. That is a really tough environment. He kind of weathered the storm. I thought Sean McVay some, made some serious mistakes. Uh, Should have went for it on fourth and goal. Uh, but they were able to persevere because they got a lot of talent. You know, you mentioned the Chiefs defense, and I I heard a couple of people bring this up this morning, you know, about the fact that, you know, Bob Sutton used to run a lot more blitzes than he does now. And some people are saying, you know, maybe the Chiefs would have blitzed a little bit more that would have helped. But, you know, John, I would argue that the, the, the Chiefs personnel was, has been weak all year. This has been a defense that has been a, a sore spot, especially in the secondary all year. So I don't think that the issue was Bob Sutton not calling blitzes. You know, people complain about Jim Schwartz. I just think it's like kind of like the Eagles. They just didn't have the personnel on the back end. No, and it, it, you can always look at the turn. If, if, if it was a D four who lined up off sides, uh, it, game's over at that point. If he just lines up on side, the game's over. Uh, and Kansas City wins. But, yeah, they're not uh, equipped. We all know, and you mentioned from Jim Schwartz in Philadelphia, for whatever reason, I think it's because people – play too much Madden and it works for them on the video games. All they say is blitz, blitz, blitz. Well, if you blitz, you're giving up something uh, on the other end. And we saw it time and time again from the Eagles perspective. When they did blitz this year, it wasn't very successful for them because they didn't have cornerbacks that can hold up. You mentioned that secondary. Uh, and even you kind of saw it. I mean, you talk about the, the Chiefs uh, it, losing, you talk about the Patriots making another Super Bowl, the Rams getting back to the Super Bowl for the first time since essentially uh, when Brady kicked this off uh, in this entire run. But the best uh, the best day of all yesterday was Tony Romo. He was so brilliant <laughs> as an analyst. Uh, he, he, he had the best day of all. But I, I thought it was interesting, the fact that he knew what was coming and the Chiefs' defense didn't. And, and that kind of tells you. I mean, players are – it's not like they're not being told. It's just not a good group. And it, it was a team that leaned on its offense. And when you lean on your offense and you don't, uh, you're not able to outscore the other team, that's 
something you gotta you gotta improve. And when you talk about the Chiefs, the front's pretty good. So you're talking about the back seven. John, before I let you go, I do have to ask you. Obviously, everyone has an opinion or a thought or something on the on the no call and the helmet to helmet. Some people have suggested that that should be something that can be reviewed by the booth. Someone should be able to call it down to the refs. People have suggested that that should be a challengeable thing by the coaches. Is there a real solution to this, or is it just, look, that guy made a bad call. And the second thing I want to ask is, you know, we saw an official fired earlier this year. Is that official who was standing like eight feet away in danger of losing his job too? I don't think so. Uh, and you never know what happens because it's a different world with all the social media and there's so much uh, fixation on it now. Uh, it was very rare that the NFL would fire an official in season. Uh, the fact that they did it was probably a slippery slope they shouldn't have started. Uh, but this is supposed to be their, you know, their best groups, playoff officials. Uh, so I don't think he's going to lose his job. I think ultimately it ends up uh, as just a, a mistake in a, in a big spot, and that'll be it. Uh, and I, for, for long term, the last thing, the last thing this league needs is more legislation. We need less legislation. Do you need to get calls like that right? Absolutely. But human error has always been a part of the game. People act like this hasn't happened before. I gave the list, and it's a long one on Twitter. People can check it out. Names like Mike Renfa wrote that people will never remember. These things have been happening for years and years and years. It's a very difficult sport to officiate. It will continue to be so doesn't mean you don't try to get it right, but you can't overreact because one bad call. And even Sean Payton, everybody made the – they took his, his quotes and, and he mentioned and he started his postgame quotes pointing out that the league admitted it was a mistake. It was unquestionably a mistake, but read the rest of his quotes. Right. And he talks about how many opportunities the Saints had. Everybody gets good calls. Everybody gets bad calls. You got to overcome them, and, and if you don't, you're not going to you're not going to be the last team standing. It, it's people don't want to hear that, but it's been going on for years. And if you don't know what the problem is, you can't fix the problem. And the bigger problem in the NFL, and I've talked about this a lot. I've talked about it with you, Josh, is the over legislation. Yeah. So the last thing you want to do is keep going down that road. You just create more problems. John McMullen, follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen or 97.3 ESPN.com, Eagles NFL Insider. Check out his piece coming up shortly about the Carson Wentz story, his perspective on it. And, of course, for all of your Eagles NFL insights, John McMullen's got you covered. He'll be back at his 4 o'clock slot tomorrow when the Sports Bash is back to normal at 4 o'clock. John, appreciate you coming on earlier today. And I, I want to leave you with one positive stat before I let you go. You ready? Shoot. Since 2000, Bill Belichick is now 13-0 versus quarterbacks in their first postseason go-around. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you can run Bill Belichick stats up the flagpole. There's a million <laughs> of them, and, and that's what happens when you're the greatest of all time. And I do feel the – I, I got to get this in real quick. I feel for Andy Reid, and I've compared him. I think he's a Hall of Fame coach. And I think he's Charles Barkley and Carl Malone in the Michael Jordan era. He's just mm. blocked by the greatest coach that ever lived. Yeah, Belichick is now three and zero against reading the postseason, seven and two overall. So, but hey, you know what? You people have talked about Belichick's role in personnel. You could argue that Reed's role in personnel may have hurt that defense as well. You know, Reed has a lot of the say in Kansas City, does he not? He does. He does. Not as much by his own accord. He didn't want as much as it ended up here in Philadelphia because he thought there was too much on his plate. Uh, but, uh, hey, you look at it, you'll see this, and you're going to see the Belichick versus Sean McVay. I think Sean McVay was 16 uh, the first time the Rams and the Patriots met in the Super Bowl where Tom won his first. Uh, and, and Sean's the flavor of the month, and, and he's the hot guy, and everybody wants the next Sean McVay. 
I don't know who's going to win the Super Bowl. The Rams are certainly the more talented team, but I will guarantee one thing. Sean McVay will not out-scheme Bill Belichick. So all the people think he's Mr. Innovative, he's got no shot. Yeah, Bel- Belichick has a has a uh, game plan in the Hall of Fame for a reason. So, yeah, that that is a big advantage, Patriots. All right, John, we'll have a lot of Eagles in NFL and Super Bowl to talk to about over the next couple of weeks. Appreciate you coming on a couple of hours earlier today. Hey, no problem. Thanks, Josh.